What's up, everybody? It's Keefe from Ghost Cult Magazine, ghostcultmag.com, and I am here with a stuffed tiger and Tommy Vex, the bad wolves. <laughs> one, one of us is not a stuffed tiger, and one of us is. <laughs> but anyway, nothing? No, just going to stare into space, high on meth, as we established. There you go. <laughs> nice. So we're here at... Uh, the headquarters of 117 Records here with Tommy to talk about his brand new record, Disobey, uh, uh, out now, which is amazing, a huge hit record, which I'm sure uh, growing up here in New York City in your life, playing in hardcore bands, probably the first time I ever met you like 20 years ago, you never imagined you would have a top 25 record in America, a number one single in the world, all this crazy stuff. It's awesome, and I'm sorry to freak you out right off the bat with the first question, but I think it's awesome. I know you as a guy, you've worked your ass off the whole time I know you, all these years, in every project you've been in, and all the guys did a great job on the record, and you guys have toured relentlessly and sur surprise dropped an EP, which we can get into, and all kinds of cool stuff on your way to this. So this wasn't an accident. You guys worked for it. I think it's a surprise, because you know you had a huge hit single with Zombie, uh, you know, Rip Dolores, and uh, it's been, uh, that by itself has, I know, exceeded like every possible dream. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> the, the, the zombie cover is obviously, has been a huge emotional roller coaster. I think when you consider the fact that, you know, myself and the members of the band were huge fans of the Cranberries, we went from, you know, from one night thinking we were about to, the next day one of our dreams was going to come true to uh, obviously the next day having uh, the worst possible news ever, you know, and then all the fans and, and our family who were affected by the untimely loss. Um, I think it's amazing that the song has done what it's done considering it almost never came out, you know, the, the first initial, initially uh, the first intuition was we have to shelf the song. And, um, you know, uh, we, we met with management and we got on a conference call with the label and, and um, our label owner, Alan Lisa Marin for Cranberries, and we talked to the family and decided to just donate the proceeds to the kids and put it out and see what, you know, and just let it, the people decide. And ultimately, it went viral. And so um, I think it's really cool. I, I, it's, it's really cool that so many people heard and understood the story and they decided that they were going to buy the song because they knew that the proceeds were going to a good place. And I think it's a testament to the rock community. I think it's a testament to the metal community, you know, where we kind of, uh, a lot of the mainstream media has been asking, like, you know, how does it feel to bring rock back to the charts? And I'm like, you know, to them. <laughs> you know uh, calm down. Uh, you know, for us to live this thing are our lifers, you know, as concert goers and performers and everything in between. Uh, every festival, everything, they're always sold out, you know, and so it's like, it really is the mainstream that, you know, I think with this song, everyone's voice was so loud they couldn't ignore it this time, you know, and also I don't think that a band in a different genre outside of rock and metal, I don't think you would see, ever see a hip hop artist doing something like this, or a pop artist doing something like this, um, but with this kind of intentions, and it's just like that's what this is what and to us it's intuitively what's right, you know. And it's a thing that there's something there's something big right about that. Definitely. Well, it's a great take on the song, and I think one other thing about the song 
besides the circumstances and the story surrounding it is it is a timeless, timeless song. And it is a song that is so very relevant to what is going on right now in the world, word for word. Um, I, and frankly, not a surprise that 25 years later it's, it's still relevant, but how, you know, so telling, so telling a song. And you guys deliver it uh, excellently. <clears throat> You know, it was it, the, the reason why Dolores came to Omo Cinema Center was because that was insecure to put it out. And we had uh, a mutual friend, Deanne Wake, who, who uh, is the managing director at the UK office, and I asked him to send it to her. I was at Wembley Arena last December, and, and we were talking, and I was like, hey, would you send this and see what you give it a thumbs up? You know, um, I think in that, it's because the song was so massive. When the song originally came out, I didn't really know what it was about. You know, I was, I think, 14, maybe 12 years old when the song came out originally, and I had a lot of family in Mansart, and my father was a veteran, and he and I more my uncle and all his cousins and, um, and whatnot uh, from the Navy and the Marines, and people were in Desert Storm, and it was a weird time, and I just assumed the lyrics were about that, and then fast forward to 2016, post-presidential uh, election, you know, we were writing songs on this record, uh, and Zombie came on in a coffee shop. And then I went into a kind of a, you know, a, 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 a Google hole, looking up the meaning of the song <coughs> and finding out all the, 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 the references to Easter Rising and the IRA bombing and going from England where the two little boys were killed and um, the message of collateral damage that she was um, protesting in the original tracking, how that stands up against all the things that are going on today from, you know, you're seeing like from terrorist attacks at concerts uh, and just in general in public places uh, all over Europe, you know, the continued, the continued arms race in the Middle East, uh, you know, the tension in America between the polarization of the, you know, electorate where people are from the Democratic and Republican side are just and, and the way that pop culture is kind of falling to it in the news and people are starting to like hate each other and then, you know, these insurmountable, uh, inexplicable gun violence that we're dealing with in, in this country to, you know, the, the, the issues with police shooting, whether it's police uh, and law enforcement who are, who are uh, unjustifiably killing citizens or people who are in going insane because of the perception of the media of all law enforcement and, and then uh, assassinating law enforcement um, and no one taking responsibility and no one offering solution. Um, so that, I think that this song really, you know, it, it needed to come out, you know, and, and I think that uh, the message, I think the reason for it is like what you said, it's a timeless song and we should be learning a little bit better about ourselves as humanity. So we'll see, you know, it's, it's like, <coughs> Well, I'm glad she did, and I'm glad you guys did. And the track just thematically also flows perfectly with the record because Disobey is a record about, it is at heart a political record, even if you guys didn't intend that. It certainly hit me that way. Uh, it certainly hit our reviewer that way who you know felt that those things are the things that actually put the record over the top in terms of being an excellent record. And uh, you know, just uh, this is a very chaotic, crazy time, and you cannot write about it. You can still, it's still pretty metal to sing about dragons and wizards and, you know, natural disasters and the devil and stuff like that, but real life is happening, and you guys definitely address real life on this release. Yeah, I, mean, <coughs> I mean, I think there's been a lack of that. I think that everyone is, uh, uh, I think artists and everyone, the internet has created a, a tone, and uh, it's created a temperature where people are things that they believe in or talk about the truth. Uh, and I don't subscribe to that. I don't believe in it. And I think that, you know, like, if you continue to persist in living in an echo chamber and don't say things that are truthful or don't want to hear things that are uh, oppositional to your opinion, you're never going to grow, you know? And even within the band, the band is like a microcosm because we all have conflicting political ideologies. We have different belief systems, you know? 
but we all love each other and respect each other and get along and we're able to have debates. And the other thing is, is too, we raise a flag on certain issues, but we don't tell people what to think. That's not our business. Like, mm. it's everyone's right to believe and think and feel how they want, how they choose based on the information they get and how it relates to them. Um, but we're saying, hey, we should all be aware because I feel like I feel like corporations and businesses or, or you know, and, and, and publications are making lots of money of making us feel like we should be afraid of our neighbors and we're not supposed to be. This is America. You know, our differences is what makes us good. And, and, and uh, I think we got tired of that. We're tired, we're, I'm tired of, of, of the TV telling me things that aren't true about stuff, you know, about the country that I love. There's a weird xenophobia going on, I think, for the first time in my adult life that I, I always thought was kind of there underneath, and now it's like way out in the open. It's crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> kind of scary. <laughs> and, you know, and, 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 it's, and it's perception is different than reality, too. Like the way that things are perceived in certain places. You know, we travel all over. I've lived all over the country, and we travel all over the country, and we talk to people, and, we're, and everyone seems to have different... Um, ideas of what's really going on because of the information that they're being fed, which is mostly untrue. You know, so it's, a, it's really frustrating. True. One other thing I wanted to talk about about the record, of course, uh, you know, obviously it's great to have a huge hit song, unexpected but great, but let's make no mistake, Bad Wolves is a heavy metal band. This record is heavy as hell. Uh, it is a straight up riff fest in a lot of places. There's some killer breakdowns. It is a well written, well executed metal record. I don't, I don't think anybody expects ten zombies or songs like Zombie Zombies by itself, kind of, uh, you know, one thing. Uh, it is a jewel, but the record has many. Uh, Officer Down, Learn to Live, Jesus Slaves, the riff in Jesus Slaves. Everybody, do your homework. Go check that shit out. It is a very heavy record, man, and and I would expect no less from this kind of low-key super group of metal dudes, but it is a distinctly record. <clears throat> now, no one, yeah, I say low-key because it's you know like almost you know you've been part of very name bands, docked every John, everybody has been in a name band, but I know that's not bandied about a lot. There are a lot of uh, collabos in the world now, more than I think I can remember in a long time. Bands just hooking up and doing cool side projects and EPs, and you guys turn this, like you said, accidentally into a band. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, very heavy. I love the writing on the record. I love the production on the record. Uh, I mean, uh, clearly you guys set out, aside from the cover, you guys set out to make a real kick-ass record. <clears throat> I mean, the album plays like a headlining show. That's what we try to do. We try to make a, 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 you know, we test vinyl. We play actual, three extra songs. You know, we're old school guys, and like I believe that a record should be made <coughs> the back with all the integrity. Each song should have as much of integrity as the next. They don't have to sound the same. They can have different themes. They can have different influences, but nothing should be uh, less or than pieces. Right on. I, I think this reminds me of a conversation I had many moons ago with Doc about Metallica and how they used to sequence their records. You know what a Metallica fan he is. And we were talking about like those first three or four Metallica records. It was like kick ass opening song, longer second progressive song, third song, heavy, fast again, ballad ish, heavy song. <laughs> like there was a sort it almost fit a formula. <clears throat> And definitely Disobey feels like that too, but not formulaic, but that kind of like, it definitely has a, a story, a narrative yeah. that it does tell uh, through these songs, which is terrific. A lot of bands aren't thinking about this. A lot of bands aren't doing this. I think it's awesome. Good stuff. Yeah, man. Um, so you guys have been on the road, killing it. Uh, huge, huge festivals. Uh, we caught you at a few, so be some cool photos and coverage coming soon. Uh, and then you guys have just been touring, touring, touring. So Europe and uh, all, all kinds of things coming up. 
Five Finger Death Punch, Headline Run, all these things. <clears throat> Mm. Label Mates, 11-7 Records. <clears throat> All right. Nice. All our Europe fans will be stoked. They're going to come out. I hope you guys hit all the big cities. <clears throat> That's awesome. Um, I, just, I just visited Europe, and it was amazing. And everybody there is a lot more low-key, chill, happy, and relaxed than here. We're all very intense here, <clears throat> New York especially. Mm, I know. Yeah. <laughs> you may be able to afford that now. Um, I no doubt LA is pricey, and you know you're from Brooklyn. You know how much it costs so to be here. Yeah, it was dirt cheap. <clears throat> right. I never in my life thought that would be the case. Same with the Bronx. Please don't call it so, bro. Please. It's terrible. They are, yeah. They. The man. True. It's going to get real, real, everybody. Tommy's in the house. Colonizers. Thank you, Black Panther, for bringing that back in the lexicon. It is, man. Why did you bring this colonizer here? But um, we all have to live with this. Um, but, you know, it is a struggle. A good cup of coffee for $2. Dunk, donkeys, man. Dunks. But anyway, man, uh, we can talk about best coffee shops in another interview. Uh, but Dunks, we got to vote here for Dunks, at least two in the room. Um, tiger? Nothing. All right. Nothing from the Tiger. He is. <laughs> He's a sellout. Hipster Tiger. Anyway, um, so yeah, man, we talked about the record. Um, I've been really interested in the marketing in this record, and certainly we're here at 11.7 Records. Good job, you guys. Um, really awesome, I thought, very, you know, sort of very well done, nicely done, you know, considering all the circumstances, everything. Very nice job done with Zombie. I know other record labels, bigger record labels, might have gone in a different direction that might not have been as respectful or cool. You guys kept that through throughout, and you still do, which I really appreciate as a fan. Uh, and then the surprise EP drop to kind of get people ready for this record. Um, <clears throat> Nice, everybody's happy. Uh, I, I remarked at the time that, uh, well, first of all, all super heavy tracks on there, obviously, and Zombie. But uh, if you had Zombie as a single and bought it, thank you, and then you bought the EP, you had a quarter of the record or a third of the record, which was, a, I think, a really good warm-up to people. Like, this is what's coming. And you don't see that a lot anymore. First of all, there's very few surprise releases in rock and metal right now. I think it's more like a hip-hop or even occasionally a country thing, but uh, really cool. I thought it was a really cool choice to do it. Why hold 
Right on. You're already touring at that point. You're already playing the brand, brand new songs to people. Well, I like that philosophy. We don't waste time. Just go. And speaking of going and touring and all these things, obviously, you know, touring's a whole nother animal than the time spent making a record and other things press. Um, you know, I know fitness is a big important thing to you. I know your personal self-care is really important to you. You talk about it publicly a lot. Um, how do you manage those things on the road? Do you, you know, sort of, uh, you know, how do you focus and keep those things together? <clears throat> And I'm not, when I'm home, my gym regimen is insane. Like my lifting is, is like six days a week, alternate body parts, cardio, this or the other. Sometimes two days a week, I'll do two a days. But it, when, when it comes to touring, it, it's like there's an athleticism associated with live performance that you can't burn out all that energy, you know, in, in, the, in the gym. So it's like an hour in the gym is enough. I have to leave, literally leave. I have to find myself I'm like, I'm leaving now. I gotta go play a show. Because I'll work out for two hours and then go on stage and be like, oh. <laughs> right. You only have so much energy. And then, you know, in recovery, you know, it's like I, I, a lot of the songs have it. I'm, I'm part of a, I'm part of a, a, a anonymous group of solo musicians that are all, all around the world and they're all constantly in contact with one another. And, um, You know, just having those touchstones around, there's the more examples of people who are, I think people in, in the public will be surprised how many people are actually sitting in the music industry that have lacked it. Um, because the old days are, you know, you don't want to die anymore. It's a boring story. Mm. Yeah, thank goodness, too, because, uh, yeah, they're, they were dropping like flies there for a while, and I'm sure there'll be more to come. Unfortunately, the Grim Reaper waits for no one, and uh, definitely, uh, you know, there's a whole correlation. You know, I think there was a, there's sort of a, I don't know, I don't want to say it's a stigma, but there's kind of a, a perception or a stereotype of rock and metal people. We party hard, we worship the devil, we overextend, right? and uh, go, you know, too hard, right? And then there's always a comeuppance, man. There's always a payback, right? Physically, emotionally, mentally. Yeah, you know, I think we still, I think that I still overextend. I still overdo it. I still go to the, I go too far. I push myself. I push myself too far. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the problem. Like, you know, it's like, you know, I don't think that that's wrong. I think... Relax. 
lot to that. So I don't know. Well, if you have like the majority of the songs in your band about either like particle physics or really good weed, you might enjoy listening to those two bands. Like, but I, I, I feel you on that. Yeah, that's so aggro. I can't imagine relaxing to those two bands in particular, who I do love both. But. <clears throat> Nice. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, P Garg, Cephalic Carnage is probably like their craziest, almost grindcore song. But uh, the tech death is strong there. Uh, I appreciate that answer about the you know the self care and uh, taking care of yourself. That's I think it's an important to talk about it openly. I think a lot of people don't, and I appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Um, yeah, man. Well, we you know there's a lot of people out there that need help and they don't ask for whatever reason. Men, especially. <clears throat> right on. Nice. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, just got a couple more for you, man. Thank you for being generous with your time. Uh, obviously, we got that hometown show looming in about a month. How crazy is it going to be? Uh, you know, this is Oh shit, it's going to be old school. It's going to be a long way from uh, even the Gramercy, as much as I love that place. It's definitely going to be a long way from uh, you jumping in the crowd and uh, singing on the floor at CB's, like, you know, the good old days or Coney Island High. <laughs> right. Over the barricade? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. <clears throat> That'd be cool. I want to say I also saw you back in the day at like SOBs or Bond Street or something really, uh, not even with a stage, like a floor and amps. Oh, pyramid, basement in the pyramid. Connell, oh, yeah. No, Connell always had that. I I knew that place. Yeah. Nice. Repping. Repping that new Candiria. Wetlands is dope. Old. Old Voodoo Lounge or Doodoo Lounge, as we used to call it. <clears throat> Castle Heights. <clears throat> Ouch. We love you, Castle Heights. Nothing personal. <clears throat> Bruised. Yeah, definitely some of those shows, the hardcore shows. Holyfield, what? Wow. E Town would come over. Yeah, it was rough. Uh, yeah, we played a lot of places uh, in the Bronx, like Blackthorn, and then like Shakers and Yonkers and crazy shit like that. So you had all like the Yonkers crew people. Rough times, but fun times. I wouldn't trade them. They're, they're, you know, they're still, they're, New York's got like a lot of great new venues now. Totally. <clears throat> Also true. We're not. Oh, do you want to start dropping dimes on people? Um, we're here for that. We could do that. Here it comes. 
Oh, he can defend himself, luckily. <laughs> this guy, he's not playing. Good stuff, man, good stuff. One thing, yeah, of course, of course. Listen, it's all funny games. Tommy Vex, the Bad Wolves, congratulations on all the success. Disobey is out now. Wherever you get music, it is. 11.7 Music is the label. I am Keefe from Ghost Cult Magazine, ghostcultmag.com, and we are out. Peace.